firstly, uh, thanks to the first two speakers, which I really enjoyed as well. And of course, I'd like to thank Giovanni for putting together this excellent series. Uh, this has been really helpful during the corona uh, pandemic to stay up to date with what's happening. Um, now, today, um, I'm uh, going to give you a little bit of an update because some of you might have seen my distinguished lecture presentation previously. So, um, because this is also a bit shorter, I've cut out all the tutorial stuff or most of the tutorial stuff, but added some new results hot from the lab, so some unpublished results as well on reading antiferromagnetic systems, writing antiferromagnetic systems, and on long-distance spin transport in antiferromagnets. Uh, since this is part of the IEEE Magnetic Society Distinguished Lecture, you get my typical one-slide advertising, and uh, I saw that the run was here as well, so I'll be brief about this. So the IEEE Magnetic Society is the largest learned society in magnetism, and we organize summer schools. Uh, we publish important journals, such as the IEEE Transactions on Magnetics, as well as the Magnetics Letters. We publish a newsletter. And if you are interested in showing magnetism also to your colleagues, there's a nice outreach video which you can show to people to see why uh, magnetism is important. And all, we, uh, in the end, uh, we uh, select every year three to four distinguished lecturers, which this year and last year have been Masashi Shiraishi, Tim Mewis, Bert Kupmans, and myself. And I invite you also to look at their talks. They also have excellent talks. And since uh, most of us have been stuck at home for the past 18 months or so, it's been really helpful to have these online seminar series and that just advertise the three that I uh, participate most often in. The SPICE uh, Spin Plus X online seminar series uh, hosted in Mainz, the uh, Spin Talk series hosted in Nebraska, Lincoln and Denver, and of course Giovanni's Petter Spin series, which is always a great source of inspiration. And since many of these also provide the talks online, I can really invite you to also look at the talks and actually um, uh, you know, see what's hot in the field. But yeah, let's start. Um, I always have a little bit of an introduction, and some of you might have seen this already as a motivation. Those of you that have not seen it, so this guy here is Louis Niel, and he intrigued me when at his 1970 Nobel lecture, he said antiferromagnets are essentially interesting but useless. And so what I was interested in, or what intrigued me is, Yes, I think we all agree that they're interesting, but are they really as useless as Neil thought at the time? So why are they interesting? Well, potentially they're extremely exciting because they allow for new devices with enhanced performance. And one is a memory where you store in the ferromagnetic case, you store the information in the magnetization pointing right or pointing left. And since the ferromagnet has at that moment, you generate a stray field and this stray field then makes these two bits which are neighboring interact. And for instance, it means that this bit here, which is surrounded by two neighbors with a magnetization pointing in the same direction, and this bit here, which is pointing in a direction which is opposite to the two neighbors, will have a different energy for the switching, which will make the switching inherently not robust. Now, this is different in antiferromagnets. Ferromagnets in the simplest case, you have two sublattices, and these two sublattices completely compensate each other, so there's zero net stray field. And this means you can bring the bits as close as you want, and this potentially allows for 100 times more packing density. But also, since in most of the antiferromagnets, we cannot distinguish between the two sublattices, i.e. this and this is the same, we can store the information not in the two sublattices pointing right, left, and left, right, but in the two sublattices pointing in the horizontal or the vertical direction. So instead of the 180 degree difference for ferromagnets, we have a 90 degree difference for antiferromagnets. And formally, we call this the Niel vector, which is the difference between the two sublattices. So here, the Niel vector is pointing in the horizontal direction, and here it's pointing in the vertical direction. And by rotating the Niel vector by 90 degrees, we store the information. So fundamentally, antiferromagnets do not react very strongly to fields, and this is reflected in the magnetic susceptibility, which is of the order of in fact, 100,000 to a million smaller for antiferromagnets compared to ferromagnets. And the good thing is that this means antiferromagnets are intrinsically not susceptible to stray fields. So you bring a permanent magnet close to such a memory and it's not going to worry. One of the important consequences of this very strong antiferromagnetic coupling of the two sublattices is that the eigenfrequencies in antiferromagnets are orders of magnitude higher than in ferromagnets. 
And this is then important because the eigenfrequencies, which are gigahertz for ferromagnets and terahertz for antiferromagnets, fundamentally set the switching speed. And so if you have an antiferromagnet, you could potentially switch it a thousand times faster than a ferromagnet, which again makes it very attractive. And actually, there's also lots more antiferromagnets than there are ferromagnets. So this is also just from a material science point of view, extremely interesting because you can have collinear, but also non-collinear, non-coplanar complex antiferromagnets as also shown in the previous talks. And the magnetoelastic coupling tends to be stronger in antiferromagnet. And I'll show you this as one of the recent results because this allows us to actually modify the antiferromagnetic order by strength. This exchange in ferromagnets is simple Heisenberg, everything is parallel, and in antiferromagnets, it can be very complex. And finally, useful, yes, ferromagnets are clearly useful. They're used in memory and sensors, and antiferromagnets at the moment, they use as passive elements and uh, in um, exchange bias for spin wells, but in order to make them useful as active elements, you need to measure and to control them, which is both difficult, and that is the main obstacle to using these devices, these and devices. So what I want to show you today is that there is antiferromagnets are really interesting, and they're possibly even be useful as active elements. And now uh, this is our last talk and everyone's looking forward to the weekend. So here's one slide for you to remember, and then you can doze off. So here's your take home message. Ferromagnets are manipulated by Ørsted field. And this is 19th century physics. Antiferromagnets can be manipulated by staggered Nielsen orbit talks, which is 21st century physics. So this is exciting. This is boring. Now that's the take home message. Now you can go and doze off or grab a coffee. Now we start with the new results, the real physics. So firstly, <coughs> for reading out antiferromagnetic systems, let me start with some recent results on X-ray based imaging. Now, if I want to image the orientation of the nail vector, say in nickel oxide, then the importance of that is that in nickel oxide, you can actually have 12 possible orientations of the nail vector. So you have four different one-on-one -on -one planes and you have within each one-on-one -on -one plane three orientations. So in order to know which direction the nail vector is pointing, we actually need to have a three-dimensional tool to map it. And this can be done using X-rays. So where we use a linearly polarized X-rays, which we shoot onto our sample and we measure the absorption of our X-rays in the sample. And it turns out there's a so-called X-ray magnetic linear dichroism effect, which means the absorption at a certain wavelength here is different. You see the black and the red curve. If our X-rays are polarized linearly horizontal or linearly vertical, i.e. they are polarized parallel or perpendicular to our nail vector. And this was first shown here in this paper by Alders and Jan Vogel and others, as well as Andreas Scholl. And we also looked at that more recently. Now, if you now go ahead and you, you look at this difference here and you plot this difference and you go to this energy and plot that as a function of position, we can actually do nice imaging of the domains in nickel oxide, where you can see that here we have three different colors corresponding to three different orientations of our nickel oxide domains. But now in order to know what is the real absolute directions in 3D space, we actually we turn the sample and we turn the polarization direction, and then we can fit our data to obtain the complete orientation of our nickel oxide nail vector. So in our case, these are four five five nineteen directions, and these are different from the bulk. And that is because in this thin film nickel oxide, which we grow in MGO, there is a strain and that actually favors just four domains. And that's great for devices because in devices you want a small number of well-defined directions. And these are, have a large out of plane components, these 5519 directions, if you're interested, the paper just came out on that. Now, this of course is not very useful for a device. If you talk to the Intels and Samsungs of the world, they would like to have electrical readout and they'd like to have electrical readout with 200% magnetic resistance change. Now, this tends to be very difficult in antiferromagnets. So, if you look to 
Uh, typical electrical readout, AMR is like 0.1%, SMR is even smaller, 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5. So you really want an effect where you can have 200% magnetic resistance effect uh, due to the change of the nail vector. And now it turns out that we found a system which is magnetic so called permaloy, where it's possible to actually transfer the information from the magnetic so called, the antiferromagnet, into permaloy and then do the readout in permaloy using TMR with a cobalt ion boron layer and 200% TMR. So we see if we image the permaloy domain structure that it looks very much like the domain structure of magnetic so gold. And actually, if you go to the synchrotron, you see there's a complete one to one matching between the manganese domains and the iron domains. So the antiferromagnetic domains and the ferromagnetic domains are exactly on top of each other. And so the question is, why is there such a strong coupling that completely imprints the direction of the nail vector in our thick manganese to gold into our thin permalloy? Well, and the reason is the following. If you do good growth, it turns out that the manganese to gold, which I show here the unit cell, always terminates with a gold atom. So if you go from one step to the next, the height of these step edges is always one unit cell, so we always terminate with gold. And why is that important? Well, if we terminate with gold here, then the magnetic ion below is manganese A site. And if you terminate with this gold here, the magnetic ion below is also manganese A site. So always just below the surface, the top layer is the red spins pointing to the right. And that means you have a completely uncompensated interface. The interface is fully polarized. And so you can have a 30 Tesla exchange lights if you want. And that's really great. So here we see that when we go to the interface between the permalloy and the manganese to gold, the top layer here is always the red spins. So it's always pointing in the same direction and you have a full uh, coupling of the permalloy to the antiferromagnet. Uh, layer, which is represented by its red spins here. And one of the great advantages, which I cannot show you yet because this is unpublished, and by the way, the paper on this is just accepted, um, is that you actually also can imprint the high frequency dynamics of the manganese to gold in the thin ferromagnet. So you can get ferromagnetic dynamics, which is orders of magnitude faster than the intrinsic fMR speed. So that's really great. Now, one um, advantage of uh, transport is, of course, it's easy, com easily compatible with CMOS devices, but sometimes you'd like to have non-contact readout. And one way to do non-contact readout is optics. I showed you x-rays, but x-rays are not easy to do in the lab. So here we did optical uh, reflectivity measurements, optical dichroism. So this was done together with a group of Eurodemsa. And we find that there we actually see an effect of 0.6% for the uh, dichroism in this manganese to gold. And, you know, 0.6%, it, it's not great, but already like uh, five times more than what we have for AMR. So that's also, you can do non-contact readout. And finally, because this ties in nicely with what Sylvia Picotzi just showed to us, 2D materials. I think also 2D materials are super exciting. These trichlorides, with this chromium chloride that she talked about, which as a monolayer is a ferromagnet, but as a bilayer is a completely compensated antiferromagnet, and as a trilayer is a ferromagnet, and so on. And we look at chromium thiophosphate, and there's some work that's just uh, uh, that I show here, which is not published yet, where we see actually also signals in the chromium um, thiophosphate uh, um, bioelectrical reader. So um, here's a summary of possible uh, readout mechanisms. I don't expect you to write this down. So if you're interested, just send me an email. I'm very happy to share the slides. We can do electrical readout, but with small amplitude. We can do X-ray and optical readout, which maybe is not compatible with CMOS, but we can do this very strong antiferromagnetic ferromagnetic exchange coupling as soon as, as soon as this paper here, which is coming out in Nature Communications. And of course, there are other mechanisms that I didn't have time to go into, but please read the papers. This is all exciting. Now, just a little bit on writing. So um, I told you that uh, magnetic fields are not very useful for writing because the strong antiferromagnetic coupling of the two sublattices means that when you apply a field, the canting is very, is very weak. So this is strongly exaggerated. Typically, it's millirad. <coughs> but still, by applying a field, we can reorient the nail vector because the induced moment due to the canting wants to lie parallel to the field. So this is so-called spin flop. 
And we can actually do that here. We've applied 30 Tesla, actually 50 Tesla to manganese to gold. And then if you apply it here this direction, the linear diagram spectrum shows first a dip and then a peak. And if you rotate it by 90 degrees, we see first a peak and then a dip. So this means we have actually rotated our nail vector by 90 degrees by a very strong field. But obviously, Tesla is not compatible with the CMOS device. So why not? Why don't use? Don't we use the uh, magneto elastic coupling, the strong magneto elastic coupling and antiferro magnets? And to do that, we actually study the orientation of the nail vector as a function of mechanically induced strain. And for that, we use this medieval torture device for samples where we place the sample on the central bar here. And then we screw the sample with these two screws and we tighten the screws until either the sample confesses or dies. Very often it first dies before it confesses, but every now and then it also yields its interesting properties. And here we see as grown, there is a flat spectrum, but when we apply just strain to get an elongation of 0.1%, then we actually see that we get an alignment of the nail vector here in the vertical direction. Now, this medieval torture device that we use is not compatible with the CMOS. We want electrical generation of strain, and this can be done using piezoelectric materials such as this PNMPT. And so here in this collaboration with the group of Brett Carmen, we actually also look at these um, systems on PNMPT where we apply a voltage here and here, and then this generates strain onto the sample. And what is interesting that these uh, strain actually leads to reorientation of the nail vector due to the applied voltage. And what is really interesting about this is that to apply electric fields is very low power. So potentially this is a low power approach to switching the nail vector. So this is all I wanted to show you as the update for the writing. Again, I'm happy to share the slides. There are many different ways also to use spin orbit talks, which I've shown a number of times. So I'm not going to repeat that here, but just for also all the students here, then if we can do reading and writing, why don't we make a memory? And actually we did, or not us, but our colleagues in Prague. So here we actually bonded, they bonded a sample into a, um, a chip carrier, which they put into an Arduino board and which they then connected by USB to the computer. And actually we have here a one bit antiferromagnetic memory. So one bit is not exactly impressive in terms of storage density, but it worked up to 12 Tesla. That of course is something that no other uh, magnetic memory can do. So there's no magnetic memory that I know that can work at 12 Tesla. All right, and now finally, some new results on transport in easy plane antiferromagnets. So um, this is interesting because if you talk to companies, very often they're interested in transporting information with low losses over distances of a few microns to a few tens of microns. And um, we study here antiferromagnetic insulators and spin current spin transport in these antiferromagnetic insulators. And we do this by putting on top of this antiferromagnetic insulator two platinum wires. In one wire, we apply a current, and therefore, by the spin hall effect, this generates a spin accumulation at the interface to the antiferromagnetic insulator. And so you inject a spin current into the antiferromagnetic insulator where it propagates, and then it is reabsorbed into the detector. And what you see here is then we can have a voltage due to the inverse spin hall effect. And for this voltage here, what we do is we measure this as a function of the distance between injector and detector to determine the transport length scale. And I should point out that this whole work was pioneered for ferry magnets in the group of Bart van Wees, and we now extended it to antiferromagnets. So why should actually it be possible to transport spin in antiferromagnets? In uniaxial and isotopy antiferromagnets, the eigenmodes actually are cyclically polarized and therefore they carry angular momentum. So you have these two modes, mode one and two, which are degenerate at zero field. And then they can each individually transport spin, but if they have the same number of magnets for mode one and mode two, the total spin transport is zero. But if we actually have this spin bias where we inject spins from the platinum, then we can populate the mode one more than mode two. And this leads to a, a higher transport of spin in that direction, this. And so you get a net spin transport. 
So this uh, we studied in hematite. Hematite is a very exciting material. It actually undergoes a Morin transition, meaning that below about 250, 60 Kelvin, you have a uniaxial antiferromagnet with the uh, spins perpendicular to the C plane. And above, you have an easy plane antiferromagnet. And it turns out that we've worked for a long time on hematite. We looked for other materials and very recently, we actually observed another antiferromagnetic insulator that also shows long distance spin transport. Again, this is unpublished, so we'll show that at the MMM conference early next year. But coming back to our uniaxial anisotropy hematite, we demonstrated here long distance spin transport over tens of micrometers, as shown in this paper here. And we also discussed whether this was spin superfluidity or diffusive transport. And we found that because we see no threshold current density and that elevated temperatures as well as an exponential decay, this is clearly diffusive. But that's great because it means even for diffusive transport, we can get to transport spin over tens of microns. And now, why is hematite so good? So this is a question that was always intriguing. And so for that, we measured the damping of hematite, and we actually found that the damping is smaller than 10 to the minus 5, meaning this is ultra low power, uh, ultra low dissipation, and so you can transport information over long distance due to this very low damping, and this was shown in this paper here. And recently, we also looked at spin pumping and looked at the mode handedness of the mode that transports our spin. And as expected, it is right handed, and the details you can find in this paper here. Now, this is great, but then the critics always say, look, uh, hematite is bad because the Morin transition is 260 Kelvin, so you cannot do anything at room temperature. And so for that, we asked our colleagues in Israel to dope our hematite in order to get the Morin transition to be above room temperature, and they manage. So here we have the Morin transition at 320 Kelvin, so we can indeed observe easy access spin transport at room temperature. But it turns out this actually is not necessary. So we found that even in the easy plane phase, we have a transport of angular momentum. And that's surprising. Because in the easy plane phase, the magnons are linearly polarized. So they do not carry angular momentum. But you can mix two linearly polarized magnons, and by that you obtain circularly polarized magnons. This was found independently by our colleagues at MIT and us, as well as the colleagues in Munich. All right, so with that, I summarize also the transport. So we've shown diffusive transport over long distances. And what I didn't have time to discuss is actually domains and domain walls influence spin transport very strongly. And there are also a lot of nice studies of spin transport uh, across um, very short uh, distances in multi layers and magnet spin valves. And now, finally, because everyone's excited about skirmions and my background is skirmions, so we looked also at skirmions and antiferromagnets. And indeed, here we see an antiferromagnetic anti skirmion and hematite. Here's the paper if you are interested. And this was first predicted by Joe Barker and Oleg Tretyakov. And actually, we found that indeed they exist. But as, as a disclaimer, we do not see in our samples chiral um, antiferromagnetic skirmions or anti skirmions. So we have at the moment no Lifshitz invariants or inhomogeneous DMI, as they call it. And also, Marins were seen in this nice paper here. Now, the most important slide, so this, of course, was not uh, done by myself, but uh, by uh, excellent people in my group. In particular, I'd like to highlight two excellent postdocs that uh, ran most of this work. So Lorenzo Baldrati uh, for switching in nickel oxide and Romain Lebrun for the spin transport in the hematite, as well as a lot of really, really good students. And my permanent staff scientist, Gerd Jakob, is a specialist on the oxides, Martin Njord, I'm pushing all the magnets to gold work, and Hartmut Sabel is our senior scientist. And at the moment, where <clears throat> we should be looking more like this again, but yeah, it's uh, still a little bit on social distancing, but things are going uphill, so I'm quite confident that soon we'll be looking like that again. We also had great collaborations and helped with slides from various people in Mainz, Bessie, and my other affiliation in, Utrecht, in uh, Norway, Utrecht, at Tohoku, Leeds, uh, Sydney, MPI in Stuttgart, Constance, Grenoble, Kyoto, and Jülich. And of course, I acknowledge support by the IEEE Magnetic Society, as well as a number of other funding bodies. And with that, I come to the summary. So I've shown you that we can read antiferromagnets using electromagnetic linear dichroism, and in particular using Kerr microscopy and using 
ferromagnets to read out the antiferromagnet by this extremely strong coupling of manganese to gold to permaloy. Here are some of the papers. I've shown you we can write uh, the information into antiferromagnetic insulators and metals by current induction, in particular also by low power strain. And I've shown you we can transport spin and antiferromagnetic insulators over long distance, even in the easy plane phase and in very low damping hematite. And since I didn't have time to give you more details, actually there's a full version of this distinguished lecture talk available on YouTube. If you're new to the field, I invite you to look at these general reviews here. There's a whole suite of papers in nature physics. And well, we also have some open positions. And if you like the slides, just send me an email. I'll also put my email address into the chat. And with that, I thank you for staying until the end. And I hope you still have some questions. And yeah, thank you for your attention.